the hearing will come to order. As this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies if there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time is has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. With that, I want to uh, acknowledge Ranking Member Cole and all of our colleagues. Uh, I am excited this morning to welcome Secretary Cardona, who joins the, Bi the Biden administration from my home state of Connecticut. It is a pleasure to have you with us today and to have your voice in this discussion. As a son of Puerto Rican parents who grew up in the projects and entered school as an English learner, and now as Secretary of the Department of Education, you bring an important wealth of knowledge and personal experience to our discussion. I know many in Connecticut are grateful for your service working for two decades in our Meriden, Connecticut public schools, and then as State Commissioner of Education. We are proud of the example you set for students, not only in Connecticut, but across this country. This week, we celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week, a time to give back and show our gratitude to the countless hardworking teachers who dedicate their lives to educating our nation's students. This is why we must continue to support teacher training and preparation programs, including additional resources for Title II. But in recognizing our educators this week, I also want to recognize you, Secretary Cardona. Thank you for the sacrifices you have made to help students of all ages, races, sexes, and backgrounds to reach for the American dream. You know firsthand how education can serve as a great equalizer that opens doors and opportunities to jobs, higher wages, and a better life. But as you will expand further in your testimony, it can only serve as this great equalizer if, and only if, it is affordable, accessible, and achievable for all. I'm so grateful to see that the Biden administration has made it a top priority to reverse years of underinvestment in our federal education system. Sadly, our schools, our teachers, our students have been struggling for far too long. In the richest country in the world, it is unconscionable that we still have teachers forced to take money out of their own pockets to buy paper, pencils, even food for their students. And students who struggle in school because they are hungry or homeless or are not having their unique needs met. And it is unacceptable that schools and school systems that predominantly serve students of color are often considerably more underfunded than schools that serve white populations. That is why I am grateful that President Biden took decisive action to respond to the economic crisis by proposing the American Rescue Plan, a plan which includes $170 billion to help K through 12 schools, colleges and universities safely reopen and to accelerate learning for students impacted by the pandemic. Further, the administration instituted uh, and initiated a bold plan to invest in American jobs, which includes $100 billion to rebuild K through 12 schools across the country, an additional 12 billion investment in community college infrastructure, the cornerstone of education and training, especially for non-traditional and disadvantaged students. And more recently, the president released the American Families Plan, which includes groundbreaking proposals 
for universal pre-K, free community college, and a major increase to the Pell Grant program to make college more affordable for disadvantaged students. The investments for universal pre-K would improve the lives of millions of children. Studies show that children attending universal pre-K programs do better academically in later grades, and so I believe investing in pre-K plays a critical role in ensuring our students are equipped with the tools they need to succeed early on. Let me, though, stress that these investments in pre-K must go hand in hand with investments in child care. We cannot afford to think of child care and pre-K as separate systems. We must make sure that our investments in child care and pre-K keep working families in mind. Breaking pre-K out from the overall child care umbrella could leave behind families who work beyond school hours, those with infants and toddlers, or those with students with disabilities. So I want to stress the importance of ensuring that we are also providing both education and child care services to working families. I'm grateful to see that the administration budget is once again taking the lead by submitting the 2022 budget request for education that lays out a plan for how to improve the lives of millions of American students and families. Mr. Secretary, your budget request for ED programs under the Labor HHS Education Subcommittee is $102.8 billion, an increase of $29.3 billion over the current levels. These increased investments are unprecedented. They are sure to go a long way to reverse years of underinvestment in our federal education system. It is not enough to just throw money at a problem. We need to work to ensure that the dollars go to those who need them the most, particularly those schools and students who come from underserved communities. No student in any state should have to accept a lower quality education simply because of where they live or the color of their skin, which is why I'm encouraged to see that the administration is working diligently to reverse such funding inequities for students of color by more than doubling the funding for Title I grants. Last year, House Democrats included the maintenance of equity provisions in the President's American Rescue Plan to protect low-income school districts from disproportionate cuts by states like we saw uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, states need to uh, step up and do a better job of equitably funding their highest need districts um, and I look forward to reviewing more details on this proposal in the president's full budget release. Uh, also pleased that the administration is helping to increase the availability of wraparound services to underserved students, providing uh, $443 million, an increase of $413 million for full service community schools. Um, since becoming chair of the subcommittee, uh, we have increased uh, funding for community schools by more than 70%. We included the program in our initiative on funding for social and emotional learning and whole child approaches uh, to learning. It's a bold investment, and we're hoping that it builds on the strong foundation established by this subcommittee. If I can just for a second, um, I'd like to quote Dr. Pam Cantor uh, from Turnaround with Children who worked with us on this initiative and something she often says in relation to the whole child approach to learning. And this is the quote, adversity doesn't just happen to children. It happens inside their brains and bodies through the biologic mechanism of stress. This is why students in poverty are well served by schools that provide holistic services and supports that account for their social, emotional, physical, and academic needs. Um, uh, and I think that that really is, is appropriate. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you for the critical funding increases you're making for IDA Part B grants to states and for programs serving historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, tribal colleges, community colleges, and under-resourced institutions of higher education. I applaud the investment you are making to post-secondary education uh, and making it more affordable for students with low incomes. In combination with the American Families Act, this administration would provide an increase of more than $1,800 to the maximum Pell Grant, the largest increase to Pell ever. Uh, also, you include $250 million for the increase to IDAA Part C, which supports infants and toddlers with disabilities 
uh, with early interventions and therapies that lay the groundwork for later learning. And the president's request also proposes $144 million for the Office of Civil Rights. Um, thank you for putting the, uh, an increased fo focus, and I know it's an interest of all of these, of all of the members of our subcommittee, that you are putting on students' mental health in this request. It's an important issue and one that became particularly clear in our hearing in March on how COVID-19 uh, has exposed and exacerbated the mental health and substance abuse crises we have in our country today. The investments are crucial. We are finally moving toward a budget and a role for government that works to level the playing field so that anywhere, so that anyone, no matter where they are, where they are from, can achieve the American dream. With that, let me thank you again, Secretary Cardona, for joining us. Uh, look forward to working with you. And with that, let me recognize Ranking Member Cole for any opening remarks. Can I ask uh, people to be on mute? Anyone who's not speaking, to mute. Thank you. Ranking Member Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Before I begin my formal remarks, I have to say, I always come to these meetings and know they're going to be interesting, uh, but I also come because I want to see the visual background you're going to treat me to every time. I mean, I feel like I live in dull places and, and, and work in dull offices every time I see this, but it looks terrific. Always does. Uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary. I want to welcome you to your first uh, hearing before our subcommittee, and I genuinely look forward to to your testimony today. First, I'd like to start out by once again expressing concern regarding the total level of spending proposed by the administration. Fiscal year 2022 budget request will be this administration's fourth proposed trillion dollar plus package, fourth in less than barely 100 days in office. The level of proposed spending is simply unnecessary, irresponsible, and unacceptable. I've been a longtime supporter of helping achieve better outcomes for our students, but a proposed 41% increase for the Department of Education in a single year uh, will leave the next generation saddled with the highest national debt our nation has ever seen. Average debt held by the national government per taxpayer is five times higher than average student loan debt. I believe we can do better than that for these futures and, and their, or for these students and uh, for our future. As a member of this subcommittee, I understand the important role played by domestic programs, and I certainly support increases for these critical programs. I was pleased to see support for special education. We know the federal government has not upheld its fair share of responsibility for ending edu uh, for ensuring that education is provided for students with disabilities. Uh, I hope we can see achieving support for sustained increases for special education as a bipartisan goal. So I applaud uh, your efforts in this area. I also believe in a strong and strong support for Pell Grant recipients. Pell Grants help first generation college students chart a course to a better future into the middle class. I'd like to see strong support for civics education, although there's some areas that I have concerns about there that I'll be raising uh, during my questions. Uh, I also believe we should do more to help underserved populations in underperforming schools. But an annual increase that is more than doubles the existing program does not strike me as a responsible or sustainable way to help these students. I also want to stress the importance of working towards a bipartisan agreement on overall spending levels for defense and non-defense discretionary spending. I've made clear the approach taken in the president's proposal for the Department of Defense is not acceptable for our nation's security and our military readiness. And while we have substantial increases in domestic programs, uh, essentially flat funding defense is not an acceptable uh, portion of the budget. We're going to have to come to some larger agreement there. I also hope we can restore the authority of the Appropriations Committee. The recent decision by the majority to pursue a partisan path of mandatory funding to pay for an extraordinary expansion of government should not be the new normal. These recent proposals outside the customary budget process represent greatest increases in taxes and government spending in modern history. To achieve them could trigger class conflict on an unprecedented scale. The president seems to believe he can convince the American people that they can have unlimited government services at someone else's expense. Fortunately, Americans are smarter than that. They know there's no such thing as a free lunch. 
So I view this the budget that you're proposing in the context of that larger disagreement. I hope there's a return to the path of discretionary appropriations where these investments belong and where both sides of the aisle can bring ideas to the table. I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming before us today. I look forward uh, to a future where we can meet uh, once again in person. I genuinely look forward to getting to know you because my good friend, the chairman, has spoken so highly of you on so many occasions, uh, and I know you'll make an outstanding point. So while we'll, we will have areas that will differ, uh, I genuinely look forward to working with you and getting to know you and, and welcome you before the subcommittee. For that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Secretary, your full written testimony will be entered into the record, and you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Well, thank you and good morning, uh, Chairwoman DeLero, uh, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, it's really a pleasure to meet you, and I do look forward to meeting in person in the near future. And I am uh, honored and humbled to serve as uh, Secretary of Education. I'm pleased to join you today and proud to testify on behalf of President Biden's fiscal year 2022 budget request for the Department of Education. I'm especially honored uh, to be testifying during Teacher Appreciation Week. And I would like to recognize all the hardworking teachers, faculty, and staff for their tireless dedication to students. You know, in particular this year, which was so challenging, I want to thank all the educators, all the teachers for what they've done. I look at this request as a way to honor the hard work of our educators. The budget request makes good on President Biden's campaign commitment to invest in education and begins to address the significant inequities that students, primarily students of color, confront every day in schools and in pursuit of higher education and career technical education. I want to first, I, want, I first want to thank members of the subcommittee uh, and your staff who helped ensure passage of the American Rex Rescue Plan, bringing vital resources to our schools and colleges across the country. I can tell you from experience that the ARP funds will ensure that school buildings reopen for full-time in-person instruction as safely and as soon as possible. Once we fully reopen buildings, we still have plenty of work to do. Generations of inequity have left far too many students without equitable access to high quality, inclusive learning opportunities, including in our rural communities. Education can be the great equalizer. It was for me. If we prioritize, we re replicate and invest in what works for all students, not just some. We must do more to level the playing field, including providing a strong foundation from birth, improving diversity among the teacher workforce, and creating learning pathways that work for all students. To that end, the budget proposal calls on Congress to invest nearly $103 billion in the Department of Education programs a 41% increase over the fiscal year 2021 appropriation to support students' success. The fiscal year 2022 request also makes a meaningful down payment toward the Biden-Harris administration's goal of reversing inequities. It starts with a proposed increase to double funding for Title I to address disparities between under-resourced schools and their wealthier counterparts, support teachers in Title I schools earning competitive wages, expand access to pre-kindergarten, and provide equitable access to advanced coursework. Our request would also build on Congress's prior commitments to uh, support the mental health needs of our students, including by increasing the number of school counselors, of school nurses, and mental health professionals in our schools. In addition, the President's request will increase the availability of wraparound services to students and families in underserved schools and communities with a significant expansion of the full service community schools program. We also think it's past time for federal government to make good on its commitment to students with disabilities and their families. And the request makes a significant move toward full funding of IDEA, proposing a 20% increase for IDEA state grants. Turning to higher education, our budget proposal begins the Biden-Harris administration's critical work to increase access and affordability for post-secondary education. The budget's proposal, coupled with increase proposed in the American Families Plan, would be the largest increase to the Pell Grant ever, helping millions of students and families pursue their goals. Importantly, our proposal would also ensure that DREAMers 
may receive full Pell Grants if they meet the current eligibility requirements. The fiscal year 2022 request paints a bold picture for the future of our institutional and student support programs. The budget increases institutional capacity and student support for minority serving institutions with additional funding for HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions, tribally controlled colleges and university, as well as those TRIO and GIRA programs that we know help ensure underserved students succeed in and graduate from college. Finally, we prioritize efforts to enforce civil rights laws related to education through a 10% increase for the Office of Civil Rights to protect students and advance equity in educational opportunity and delivery in preschool through college. Working together with stakeholders, including educators and students, we can and will heal, learn, and grow together through this challenging time. I'm committed to working collaboratively with each of you and to strengthen local decision-making and help improve opportunities, pathways, and outcomes for students across this country, including in our rural communities. So I wanna thank you and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, a, a pleased in your testimony to hear about $20 billion for, for, for Title I. Um, and addressing the uh, funding disparities uh, uh, between under-resourced schools, districts, and their wealthier counterparts. Um, uh, what is of concern to me is that 90% um, uh, of K through 12 education funding in this country comes from states um, and districts. With just a handful of exceptions, I'm concerned that most states do not sufficiently prioritize funding for high poverty districts and communities of color. Given the reality, how do you see the proposed $20 billion uh, increase to Title I improve the uh, equity in, uh, uh, in, in, in state uh, funding? Thank you. Well, we know, you know the, the elements of this plan really serve to communicate the transformational impact that uh, President Biden and the team want to have in education and really value the role that education plays in the growth of this country. So the Title I allotment really helps level the playing field by making sure that our schools, uh, especially our students uh, in greatest need, have additional resources to provide more uh, reading instruction, more social emotional support for these students, uh, providing them the, the intervention and support that they're gonna need so that it could education could be that equalizer for them. Uh, this targeted approach toward Title I uh, schools and programs really aims to make sure that when we're out of this pandemic and when we're thinking about education in the years to come, we're making sure that all students have access to high quality opportunities, high quality instruction, additional support to be successful in school. Uh, I, I, I thank you. And one of the things that we did uh, in protecting high poverty districts uh, from disproportionate state cuts, uh, we included critical maintenance of equity provisions. Um, and uh, I, what I will do is, is, is for the record, I think, uh, 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 send a question to you with regard to that issue of maintenance of, uh, maintenance of effort. If I can, let me uh, 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 move to student loan uh, servicing crisis. Um, 2017, the, the Trump administration, uh, Office of Federal Student Aid announced uh, next gen. Uh, uh, this was a promise to improve student loan servicing for borrowers and to achieve cost savings for taxpayers. Uh, $277 million uh, uh, later in increases um, uh, uh, since 2017, uh, three operating offices at FSA, the Trump administration and FSA failed to deliver on the promise the very moment. Uh, at the last moment, they attempted to create a new system, the Interim Servicing Solution, ISS, to correct the failure. Um, in a bipartisan rebuke of this effort, Congress instituted a 90-day pause on any award under the ISS solicitation. Uh, that pause expired in March of this year. Uh, my question is, where do you think stand with regard to the Next Gen Initiative? Um, will you be moving forward with awards under the ISS uh, so solicitation? Thank you. And, you know, just to gonna go back, I do look forward to the uh, question on record, but it, it is critically important that the maintenance of effort, maintenance of equity is a part of this. We cannot be using funds to supplant. Uh, our, st our students need more, not less. They need more now. So we want to make sure that we're working with our states to ensure that they're doing their part as we do ours. Uh, and with regard to your question now, the next generation, um, 
you know, we, we do look forward to, to working on this. It is paused. And, um, we haven't made decisions yet about how we're moving forward, but I can assure you that I agree wholeheartedly that we need to do more as an agency. I'm thrilled that we brought on Richard Cordray, who's really known to be a consumer uh, protection uh, uh, guru. We need that level of advocacy and support for our students who are, are borrowing to go to college. We need to keep the students at the center of the conversation. So all these conversations are something that I'm really keenly aware is going to be critical to make sure that we're protecting our students, not our loan uh, agencies. And uh, I, I can assure you that I want to work with you and others to make sure that we're addressing those issues in, in a timely way. Okay. And I might add that Congress has provided about $800 million for the temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness program. Uh, that was intended to address the failures of the department and student services, services in administering uh, the, the program. As of November 2020, the department has only discharged $95 million in loans. Um, what is the department going to do to ensure the funding is used as intended? Thank you for the question. And, and similarly, I think what we need to do better with public service loan forgiveness, about 98% have been rejected of the claims that put in. To me, this really needs a very critical look to make sure that the intention that you had in Congress um, is, is followed through on and that we're doing everything to put our students at the center of the conversation, make sure we're serving students. So again, a lot of attention is gonna be placed on this moving forward. We're bringing folks on board that have that mentality to make sure that we keep the students at the center of the conversation. We serve students. We have to make that very clear in our policies. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me now yield to uh, Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And again, welcome, Mr. Secretary. It's good to have you here. Um, I have some big questions I want to ask you, but I've got something that's important to me personally. It's smaller and more targeted and uh, want to give you an opportunity to respond. I know that you and I, and certainly the chairwoman, agree that our nation's students need more and better civics education. I'm deeply concerned by a federal register notice uh, published last month by your department proposing competitive priorities for the national programs in civics. Uh, that proposal actually triggered just a blizzard, at least in my office, of bipartisan, I'm gonna stress bipartisan, uh, critical response. It's uh, effectively, in my view, jeopardizing uh, civics as a bipartisan priority uh, and potentially jeopardizing a, a piece of legislation the chairwoman and I have worked on together for uh, a long time. Specifically, the Federal Register notice references the 1619 project and the work of a controversial scholar. These references have politicized civic uh, education, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and created an impression that the administration cannot be trusted to promote civic education in a bipartisan, non-ideological way. Civic education, in my view, ought to heal what divides our country. And this proposal, in my view, exacerbates that. In light of those concerns, would you, number one, explain the uh, uh, reference, if you're familiar with which respect you are, and, and then can, so would you consider withdrawing the proposal pending further consideration? So thank you uh, for the question. You know, it, it's, I, I came from the uh, local district level. I, it's, I was fortunate to serve as commissioner of education in Connecticut and curriculum decisions are made there uh, with local control. Uh, with input of local stakeholders uh, and, and the community there. And that's where it should stay. Uh, the education department does not uh, mandate curriculum, nor does it uh, lean in one way or another. Uh, what it does do is provide uh, uh, parameters for grants to be submitted, clarity uh, so that those who are submitting grants uh, can submit. Did you want to speak? Uh, yeah, well, again, I, I appreciate that. I think uh, Chairwoman Delora is going to ask someone to mute. <laughs> yes, if I can, please, we're trying to, whoever is unmuted, please mute so that we can hear the testimony and the questions. So, uh, Congressman Cole, I'm going to be quick because I, I see your time is ticking. But, but I do feel, listen, I, I've been an educator for over 20, 22, 23 years. It's critically important that our educators have voice in developing curriculum because we know uh, that curriculum should serve as a window and a mirror and a sliding door into uh, their own experiences and other experiences as Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop has taught us in education. Um, so curriculum does a lot more 
uh, it, it, what it does is engage students and students should always see themselves in curriculum as well. So I welcome uh, seeing states come up with creative ideas on how to have students be seen in their curriculum, but do so in a manner that builds community. Educators can do that. We can build community under one flag by doing this. And I have complete confidence in the educators across the country that they can get it done. Sue, I used to be one of my son's a public school teacher. So uh, uh, and I appreciate your remarks, by the way, honoring our teachers. Uh, but, you know, I am worried when something, and I agree with your statement, we should not be dictating curriculum at the federal level. That's not our role, it's not our responsibility. But when I see grant standards laid out in the 1619 project, which, you know, we can discuss at length, but it's very controversial. And I see a, a scholar, respected scholar, I'm sure, but again, controversial scholar. And those are sort of laid out. The, the, the impression left is, okay, we want a particular version or a particular kind of civics taught. Uh, and we're dictating. And, and I'm, again, I've had these the people contacting me. I think you had 37 senators write you about this. Uh, across the political, it's not Republican, it's not, I actually had Democrats that are interested in civics education. Uh, this also raises issues. So I don't have a lot of time left. I certainly want to give you a chance to respond. And I certainly would welcome a further dialogue about it. I really want to flag this because I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, the political opposition to what I consider a bipartisan bill and something we ought to be working on is growing. And it's growing across the political spectrum. And that registry notice has to do with sparking this off. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Paul. I appreciate your perspective. I, I can assure you that I do want to work with you and others to, to listen to the different perspectives. And, and let me just underscore, you know, our educational system, yes, we have a divided country, but our education system is going to unite us. Again, uh, the goal here is to really build community, have students engage in their learning, and grow together. But thank you for your comments. I agree with uniting. I understand with this, uh, but that registry notice did not doing quite the opposite. So I would just ask you to review that. And, uh, I would look forward to a further dialogue with you about it because I don't want to lose a good piece of legislation. I think we're gonna uh, over over this uh, issue. With that, Madam Chair, thank you. You've been very indulgent. I yield back. Look forward to talking to you about other things, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congressman uh, Pocan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's a pleasure to meet you virtually. Um, I, I also serve on the Ed and Labor Committee in addition to this subcommittee, so I've got the feeling we'll be working together a lot. I'd like to try to get to three subjects, so I'm going to ask the questions right away, and if you can give uh, answers so I can get to three subjects in five minutes, I'd appreciate it. Um, you know, we know that our public schools have been underfunded, especially Title I and IDEA programs, and that's hurt uh, many kids' educational opportunities. Very glad to see a significant investment in the, the fiscal year 22 budget. But while we don't have our full budget, I want to discuss my concerns about the lack of oversight on the hundreds of millions of dollars distributed by the department through the charter schools program. Between 2006 and 2014 of the 4,829 schools that got charter school grants, 37% of those schools never opened, 11% uh, opened uh, um, uh, and then closed. Uh, and it's a large percent of schools uh, I might be giving the wrong percent of the second one, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, we, we've had a large percent of schools that have had, had this happen. The amount of funding estimated to have been given to those schools is close to $500 million. Uh, the IG uh, looked at this uh, and they said that uh, the department did not include charter school closure and risk assessments when they were based uh, basing oversight and monitoring decisions. And the closure process lacked oversight and the risk of significant fraud, waste and abuse of federal program funds is high. Uh, just like to talk to you about uh, if you're willing to commit to review that previous uh, inspector general reports and implement their recommendations. I am interested in making sure that we're holding uh, folks accountable for the funds that they get and ensuring that all students get a good uh, education, including in charter schools, that, that the money is being used for what is intended and that our students are getting a good return on investment. Uh, and speaking of support and, and oversight, I want to just quickly acknowledge two folks that are in the room with me, Larry Keene and Donna harris Aiken, for their support and preparation for the materials today. They don't want to leave that out. Great. So you will be looking at those reports and you will be implementing the recommendations? I will be reviewing the reports and uh, I'd be happy to discuss further with you uh, further steps, but I will be reviewing the reports. Thank you. Great. Um, also on student debt, you know, I introduced a bill back in 2013, a number of people have done it since then to try to allow the refinancing student loans. We know 
Uh, the burgeoning debt uh, is huge, uh, $1.57 trillion. Um, you know, right now, some people are still paying like 6% or a mixture of different loans. It's not easy to consolidate, to get rid of uh, those rates. Rates are historically low. Uh, is, is there any uh, way that you would look at and support the effort to be able to refinance your student loans at a lower rate, um, perhaps the lower, uh, whatever the current rate is, so that we could help uh, relieve some of that additional burden? Thank you, Congressman. We really have to have a, a very uh, broad look at how we're, serving, how we're servicing students and how our policies are creating obstacles for students. I'm really eager to make sure that once Rich Cordray gets uh, on board and we have our undersecretary, that we really revisit all strategies, including those, to make sure we're giving the students the best opportunity to be successful and go through college without having a huge debt burden when they graduate. So nothing is off the table. Yes, I am interested in looking at ways to provide a easier opportunities for them to make uh, college affordable. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think this is really one of the easiest lifts that out there. It's a bipartisan legislation that's out there. Um, but, you know, as you know, bills don't pass Congress these days too often. So uh, anything that the department could do in this area would certainly be appreciated. Um, I I've had a request from some universities in my district. When will the department issue guidelines on spending the institutional portion of the American Rescue Bill plan? Um, you know, they're, they're just trying to get some idea of when you might uh, provide some of that. They've been very busy and, um, you know, I, I respect their, the need for them to have this information. As you know, there's vetting, pro there's different vetting processes and uh, comment portions that have to, we have to go through, but I'm, I'm pleased to share that I think within the next two weeks, they're going to be getting information on that. That's awesome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. And since you uh, have been very brief, I can get to one more question. Sure. Um, yeah. There was an issue back on charter school programs. You know, I've been in the legislature uh, for 14 years before I came to Congress on my fifth term, uh, seen some of the worst, you know, in these programs. I think a lot of public dollars get wasted. Uh, there was a, a program, the Charter Management Organization, uh, an ID, IDA uh, charter school that um, received 100 million in awards. Uh, the school was ruled ineligible by the department staff, and yet the the secretary at the time apparently um, uh, appealed that and let uh, another million dollar grant go out in 2020, and a total of 72 million over five years uh, for the uh, replication and expansion of high quality charter schools. Um, would you commit that the charter schools who are determined to be ineligible by the department for a grant cycle don't receive funds? I'm going to look into that further, but yes, I think if, if they're not eligible, I think I'd be hard pressed to understand why we're funding. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. I yield back, Madam, Madam Chair. Congressman Harris. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. You know, someone who's been on a faculty for 30 years in the past, I appreciate, you know, your experience in education as well. Uh, let me bring up a couple of issues. First, just to reiterate what uh, Ranking Member Cole said, you know, I'm also concerned about the 1619 project working its way into a, some kind of federal curricula. I urge you to look. There's a Wall Street Journal piece written last year by uh, Ms. Latasha Fields, a black American from Chicago, who, uh, in the article is entitled God, Parents, and the 1619 Project. I just urge you to consider that and read that before you consider in any way adopting the 1619 Project into any federal curricula. Now, I also want to follow up on uh, some of the questioning from your uh, confirmation hearing over in the Senate. Uh, I, Mr. Scott, Senator Tim Scott, uh, who I think uh, represents the, the feelings of many uh, people who, are, who feel that the education system is failing them, asked you about the OSP program, the Opportunity Scholarship Voucher Program in Washington, D.C. You were noncommittal at the time, in the beginning of February. Uh, I'd like to know if you have looked into it more and if uh, now you are, in fact, support the idea of the Opportunity Scholarships in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we we are looking into that. Uh, we, I am getting more information. You know, I want to make sure that there there's a need, there's an interest in order to support it. I certainly want to protect the learning opportunities of those students that already are in it. Uh, obviously, we make sure we, we allow those students not to have additional disruptions in their programs. But yes, we are still looking at uh, what the need is and what the demand is to, to then make decisions about how to fund it. Well, Mr. Secretary, you know, this is a subject I've been interested in for years. Uh, there's a waiting list for those. There are lotteries for those. Uh, how do you question the need or demand? I mean, your people at the Department of Education haven't told you that, in fact, there's always more need and demand than, in fact, available funding? Well, again, 
meeting with my staff, uh, I will find out more information, more specifics, but there's also been, uh, you know, some question about uh, the funding that goes to it and whether the demand is there for, for that funding. Well, we'll, we'll follow up. We'll follow yeah. up with you because my time is short. Um, uh, you know, of great concern to me is the revelation in the last few days that the CDC was in communication with teachers unions to develop uh, the medical guidelines for school reopening. Now, teachers unions have a lot of teachers in them. I don't think they have a lot of doctors in them. And I think that decision should be made on scientific medical basis. Uh, but of interest is that uh, Ms. Psaki in a, in a uh, press conference the other day said that the administration is going to involve, of course, the CDC, but they will involve the Department of Education in coming up with these CDC guidelines. So I want to know very briefly, have, are you in contact with the teachers unions and, and in, in contact with the CDC and somehow communicating teachers unions uh, demands to CDC using the education department? Absolutely not. I, I do feel that my success in Connecticut with reopening schools was through a good, thorough partnership with our educators, our leaders, uh, and then having uh, conversations about how to safely reopen schools does involve a, a very strong connection with CDC and our health partners, but it also includes looking at what the needs are in the building because ventilation and things like that that are uh, mostly under resources but, but should also to... be taken into account. Just to get it straight, so you have not had email communication or other communications with the teachers unions about the CDC reopening requirements going into the future? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, uh, the, with regard, so with regards to reopening schools, I think medically, I think there's pretty clear indication that that is a, that that's something that should proceed, probably should have proceeded a while ago, and I appreciate that, that you did that just that in Connecticut. Now, finally, I want to close following up on what Senator Rand Paul and Senator Romney asked you about, which is a, a, a topic of great interest to me as a daughter who is an NCAA All-American athlete. Uh, the testimony you gave in the Senate indicated that you actually support biological boys competing with uh, girls in school sports. So I just want to get you on the record. This is the House side. That was the Senate side. Is that true? Thank you, Dr. Harris, and congratulations to your daughter. I, I'm going to be very clear, and thank you. For I, 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 listen, I want to thank you, Dak, because there's yeah. no way she could compete against biologic males. Thank she you. would never have gained all-American status, but I'm, I thank await you. your answer. Yeah, and I, there's no way that I wouldn't support all students in our country to have opportunities to uh, engage in school activities, which include extracurricular. So, as I said, that I'll say it again. Trans biological boys should be competing with biological girls. That's a very specific way. I understand we can create transgender leagues. I don't mind. Should biological boys be competing with biological girls? As I said, then I'll say again. Uh, transgender students deserve every opportunity to participate in all school activities. And I will take that as including to compete against biological girls. I'm disappointed. I yield back, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Clark. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman DeLora. Welcome, Secretary. We are thrilled to have you. And I just want to start uh, by thanking you for your last answer and for standing up for equality for every single one of our kids. Um, I want to specifically ask you to start off about the serious shortage of mental health professionals. I am so pleased to see a billion dollar request to increase the number of those professionals in school settings. Um, but I'm interested in how, if you have thought about strategies as Secretary of Education for increasing um, and addressing the shortage of mental health professionals overall as we are looking to increase them in our schools. Thank you, Congresswoman Clark. So, you know, I, I'll start by saying when I visited uh, this last month, month and a half, I visited uh, about nine states, 10 different schools. And one thing that came out loud and clear is the need for our schools to look different than they were prior to March 2020. And one of those differences is the need for better social emotional supports, better mental health supports, our students are in greater need there. So your question is a very good one. How do we create the capacity there? How do we look uh, to connect our K-12 institutions with our institutions of higher education to make sure that 
we're preparing enough uh, professionals to fill the demand that we have in our schools to meet the social emotional needs of our students. So we need to be creative about creating pipeline programs, ensuring that our students have pathways in our K-12 systems to get into the higher education space around that social emotional support or degrees in uh, school counseling, social work. Uh, that's critically important. Not only do we have to um, rethink our organizational structure for our schools, but we also have to create clear pipelines for our students who are in school now to think of themselves as future mental health professionals. Thank you so much for that and for your emphasis on it. And we know this has been a time uh, that has really inflicted great trauma uh, from, uh, you know, and as always, even more so on low income children and children of color. We look at nearly 40,000 children in this country have, at, have lost at least one parent and black children account for 20% of those kids. And we know that trauma is at the base of uh, sometimes behavioral issues at school. And the previous administration rescinded uh, Obama era guidance on disciplinary practice that warned schools they may be violating federal civil rights if one racial group was overrepresented in disciplinary uh, actions taken. As Secretary of Education, um, will you restore that guidance on school discipline and update it to address policing in schools? You know, I remember being an assistant superintendent when I read that and, and was shocked because our efforts were really to try to reduce disparities in exclusionary practices. We know students of color, students with disabilities um, are targeted differently and discrimination of any form is unacceptable, including of our LGBTQ and trans students. So yes, this is a high priority for me to make sure that all students have a fair shake. Yes, we're gonna make sure that accountability is there. We're gonna make sure that education and support to our systems are there. And that's what this American uh, uh, Families Plan and American Rescue Plan can do. Training to help our educators understand the differences of what trauma looks like and what poor behavior looks like. So that we can meet the needs of our students where they are, especially after this pandemic. With regard to your question about uh, school resources and, uh, and uh, school resource officers in schools. Listen, this was one that I'm gonna need more information. I've seen examples of where it's, it's very helpful to have members of the school community in the school helping the learning happen, including police officers, uh, uh, resource officers. But I've also seen examples where it worsens the disparities in exclusionary practices. So more to come on that, but I definitely wanna hear more. And in my few remaining seconds, um, we are, I, I cannot tell you what it means to have an administration that understands the value of early education. Most of that funding and oversight uh, resides in HHS. If you could just briefly tell us how we can support your work in collaboration around early ed with uh, health and human services. Thank you. Uh, you know, the research and the practice around early childhood education is it, there's a huge gap there. And, and for us, it's really about making sure we're creating that culture of understanding of how important early childhood education is in our country for our young learners. We know students that have access to high quality instructional programs at the early ages do better in high school. They get honors courses. Their potential for college is greater. So continue to beat that drum with us. Make sure that we're supporting programs that have high quality. Uh, and making sure that as the money get, makes its way to the state, that they're being invested in high quality programs. That's how, how you can support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Congressman Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, congratulations, Secretary. Uh, I do want to briefly acknowledge that this is National Teacher Appreciation Week. I hope you and my friends on both sides of the dais will acknowledge our great American teachers and their great efforts. Um, Mr. Secretary, in my previous efforts on this subcommittee for years, I've worked in conjunction with colleagues across the aisle and with outside stakeholders to provide STEM education opportunities to rural and low income communities. Most recent data shows that 3.5 million STEM related jobs will need to be filled by 2025 in order to maintain a stable workforce. It is imperative that we continue to support public-private partnerships to close the skills gap and cultivate a diverse workforce. Uh, my first question, sir, 
As we begin to reopen schools, how do you believe Congress could help in your efforts to increase STEM and computer science education in low income and rural communities? And what is the administration doing to promote public private partnerships in this area, sir? Thank you for that question. And you're absolutely right. I think if there's anything that uh, stood out in topics that I've had conversations with uh, elected officials at the state and at the national level, it's the need for us to do more there. I really feel we need to evolve our system to make that clearer pathways into the workforce, uh, a reality for students starting in middle school. And, you know, I have had experience on a workforce council where we brought our workforce partners, our CEOs around the table with higher education, with our K-12 leaders to come up with strategies to make sure that we have sustainable plans to do that. And I look forward as Secretary of Education to really move the needle on that. I'm really passionate about that. I think that has to blend K-12 expertise with higher education expertise with workforce partners. So you're absolutely right. We need to listen to our workforce partners, but have them have a seat at the table when we're planning because regionally really is where we can get the most bang for our buck. When we know what the needs are regionally, we can make internship experiences together. We can develop curriculum with our partners in the workforce. There's a lot of room for growth there in this country and I look forward to leading that. Thank you. And as a follow up to that, Mr. Secretary, I'm sure you're aware the STEM Master Teacher Corps was authorized by the Every Student Succeeds Act, but has not yet been funded. I would just respectfully request that the administration work with my friends in, in both houses and both parties to, to fund that. Um, a follow-up question, sir. Girls Who Code reported around 74% of middle school girls express interest in STEM, yet only 0.4% of high school girls choose to pursue these interests in college. In order to diversify the personnel, how can we better monitor girls who are already interested in STEM, sir? That's a great question. It, 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 it shows how our K-12 system needs to evolve to the needs of our communities. Um, and, and if they're interested in it early in their education career, how are we losing them by the high school year? So we have to do a better job connecting our, uh, our female students out into the field, looking at job potential, looking at career pathways, earlier, we have to be more assertive, more aggressive, ensuring that they understand that these options exist for them as well. We should also bring in mentors that are in the STEM field to come in and talk to our students and create programs intended not to have that slide off. So, you know, that's that you're, you're highlighting work that I'm pretty passionate about and I look forward to doing as Secretary of Education. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, Secretary Cardona, in, clo in closing, I just want to say that many of these STEM programs do require in-person lab classes, I hope that you will work with us, um, with the administration, to diligently, safely reopen our schools and our economy. And Madam Chair, I thank you and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman Frankel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us today. I have a comment and then I, have, I do have some questions. I, I'm sure you're aware that women have uh, really uh, suffered the brunt of the economic harm of this pandemic, losing the majority of jobs. Uh, this week, the Georgetown Center Education and Workforce released a report that 90% of traditional infrastructure jobs uh, go, will go to men. Uh, so I just wanna urge you in your conversations uh, with the president and the vice president and others uh, that you not only advocate for the inclusion of women in traditional infrastructure jobs, but really emphasize the importance of investing uh, uh, and, and creating and improving the pay for new childcare slots, elder care, and especially the early education, which I know is in your area. Uh, and thank you, we're, we're hoping you'll be a good advocate for us. Uh, question. Um, we know uh, that, there, that the issue of sexual violence on campuses ha has been a significant health issue. Unfortunately, uh, many of us believe that the uh, last administration took us backwards in terms of keeping uh, sexual violence, uh, diminishing it on campuses because of a change in Title IX rules. Can you give us an update where your department is in the process of rescinding those rules and issuing new guns that actually protects vi victims and survivors. 
Thank you, Congresswoman Frankel, first of all, for your comment. You're absolutely right. You know, when we talk about the inequities that were exacerbated by this pandemic, uh, women have had a harder uh, time recovering from this because in many cases it's affected their jobs. And when we talk about childcare and the needs there, the American Family Plan hopes to address that. But I absolutely agree with you that as we're thinking about recovery as a country, we need to continue to make sure that we're providing opportunities for jobs for women as well. Uh, with regard to the question that you asked, about uh, Title IX, you know, part of this process, and we're looking forward to having information as soon as possible because I know folks are waiting for it, but we're, where we are in the process now is in the listening phase. As you know, uh, public comment is critically important for us to make sure that whatever we put forth takes into account the needs uh, and the concerns expressed by those we serve. So we are in that process, and um, that's a very important part of the process. Once we're done with that, we look forward to moving quickly to make sure we have guidance out there uh, because like you, I agree that sexual discrimination or any type of harassment has no place in our uh, in our ca college campuses. Mr. Secretary, do you actually have proposed rules that are being commented on? There is a comment uh, period now that, that is taking place, yes. Thank you. And I, I know during the uh, pandemic, uh, there's there was a... Uh, a flexibility on standardized tests and so forth. So uh, we've heard some, from some teachers who think that there, these flexibilities should continue. Uh, do you have an, a, a comment on that? Is the administration going to try to uh, extend those flexibilities? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the, the issue of uh, assessing students at this point in the pandemic is a really tough one. Uh, it reminds me of the decision we had to make last July about reopening schools. There's no one way of doing it that works for everyone. With that said, as we're, as we're thinking about how to distribute $130 billion in the American Rescue Plan to our schools, um, any little bit of data helps. Um, so that I can ensure that we're closing equity gaps uh, through those funds, right? So if this group of students was hit harder, I wanna make sure that more funds go there. But I know teachers across the country don't need a standardized assessment to tell them how their students are doing. There's not one teacher that needs that to tell them how their students are doing, they know. With that said, when we're making policies and when we are distributing millions and millions of dollars, it helps to know which communities need double the money. So that when I see resources being used to make class sizes of, of nine in one class where other classes may have 20, I understand that based on the, how the students performed the, the, the impact of the pandemic. So I recognize it's not an easy one. And then moving forward, because your question was about extending them, I hope to have robust conversation about how to evolve our assessments to make sure they measure what they're supposed to measure. Thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. You know, a little bit in that last question, obviously um, throughout the pandemic, we have heard, I've heard from parents nonstop uh, who have struggled to help their kids during uh, the remote learning. And whether it was, you know, we're seeing incredibly uh, scary increases in mental health challenges and, and suicidal either ideation or um, attempts um, at, to just learning loss. You know, I was looking at a McKinsey study from the end of last year talking about, um, you know, learning loss experienced by black students was about 10.3 months. Latino, well, they say Latinx, and I'm just, that's a personal thing. I hate the term Latinx as someone of Latin descent. So Latino students, uh, 9.2 months, and students from low-income backgrounds uh, from a 12.4 month. Uh, could he, and that was at the end of last year. could be even greater. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, the Seattle Times has been following, obviously, the school uh, closures uh, issue significantly in that, like, some of, some, I think it was just last year, last week, Seattle teachers finally came back into the classroom after the, the governor, the Democratic governor, announced that we could reopen schools months ago. And he even put uh, teachers near the, the front of the line with regard to getting vaccinations, recognizing you need to make sure they're safe if you're asking them to go back into the classroom. All of those things I applauded. However, um, the story that I just found um, talks about how basically um, those districts that primarily serve white children and districts in counties where a majority of them voted for a previous president um, reopened 
more more quickly to students than the more liberal leaning or racially diverse communities. And interestingly, it didn't always follow um, health indicators. Like the, the analysis found that the counties with the highest COVID death rates had a higher average uh, proportion of students in classes than the rest of the state, meaning that it, the, the, the death or the CDC recommendations didn't always get taken into account when they were deciding how to put kids back in schools. And I really wanted to see, um, you know, in light of this learning loss, especially among our most vulnerable, especially among those that the whole public education system, in my mind, is really geared towards. Like, that's the goal, is that right. no child is less than any other child. So how do we make sure we catch them up? What is your, is your department more um, aggressively pursuing, making sure that, you know, one day a week is not good enough for some of these kids in some of these districts? And again, I noted our Democratic governor has really stepped up to the plate to say, you need to do this. Yeah. And yet they're still not complying. How are you going to take on some of those bigger, more intransigent systems that are not geared towards the kids' best needs? Thank you for that question. And I appreciate the way you laid it out. I agree with you wholeheartedly. The best equity lever we have is in-person learning now, not the fall, now. And we need to do everything to get our students in. Every day that they're not in the classroom is a day wasted to have social emotional engagement, to have that access to a teacher, a caring school environment, where, as you mentioned at the beginning of your comments, we know students are suffering um, due to the trauma that they've experienced. They need to be in the classrooms. What we've done is, you know, work with our partners at CDC to get to get guidance. We, we had the reopening school summit. We have over 1,100 entries of best practices that were submitted. We have a clearinghouse with about 200 practices that districts could learn from one another. But we're also building up a system very quickly to get new data to make sure that we're reaching out proactively, talking to the governors, talking to the commissioners, talking to the superintendents, if necessary, sending a team over there to support them because we can't wait. So I'm very passionate about that. I agree with you wholeheartedly. We need to get the students in right away. Unfortunately, though, what I have seen in my tour is some of these urban centers have buildings that are 120 years old that haven't had a ventilation system looked at in years. So there's a lot of disparate need that we need to address. But I do appreciate your passion and I share it with you. My goodness, always when it's my It's question, awesome. I love it. it. This is the education budget, so it's very appropriate. Well, that, the other piece of that I just can't get over is that I feel like it really is the most vulnerable who are going to pay this price while we're protecting every other institution in, in the system of education. And it frustrates me that we've put a lot of money, we sent billions of dollars to the states to help with this, to help with upgrading HVAC systems, and to hear people not take advantage of those. I mean, we can send all the money in the world there. Unless there's some sort of teeth, um, I think those kids are going to continue to pay. And I want to understand that you've got their back even over some of the adults in the system. Exactly. And thank you for sharing that. And I continue, I want to continue to have conversations with you uh, about where, you know, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, but I, I cannot agree anymore. We need to advocate for children here. We need to keep students at the center of the conversation. You're absolutely right. Some kids are being hurt more than others. We need to be aggressive about reopening now, providing whatever supports they need. So support and accountability have to be equal here. And I totally agree with you. The plans that the states are providing within the next couple, three weeks, must include how they're going to address uh, equity and how they're going to engage stakeholders. We need to get our kids back right away. Thank you for that. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Congresswoman Bustos. All righty. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Secretary, great to see you again. I, I do want to publicly thank you for visiting Illinois last month with the First Lady. It was uh, really good to have you at Sauk Valley Community College. Um, today, if I may, I'd like to talk a little bit about teacher shortages. Um, I, I gave you a little handout when you were in, in, uh, in our region that went over a little bit of, about this, but um, the American Families Plan, um, just so great to see that President Biden is requesting doubling the yearly TEACH grant award from $4,000 to $8,000. And that's for students who commit to teaching a high need subject in a high poverty school district for, for four years. I, I think it's terrific, so thank you. Um, also want to applaud the $2.8 billion for, dollars for teacher residency programs and the $1.6 billion for grants for teachers uh, to obtain additional certification. So um, that plays into helping to address teacher shortages. 
Um, major, major problem in my home state of Illinois, where right now, as we're having this conversation, school districts have about 4,200 unfilled positions. You know, think about that. Shortage of, of teachers, of paraprofessionals, of other <coughs> licensed staff. In, in my, the congressional district that, that I serve, we have 400 vacant positions, and that, that's a lot. So um, if, if you can talk a little bit about the American Families Plan and, and how that will impact addressing this teacher shortage issue. Sure, first off, let me say Sauk Valley gets it right. If you wanna see an example of how a community college could lift a community and provide pathways for careers that exist now, visit Sauk Valley. It's like a commercial. I really, I'm smiling because it was one of the best visits I've had um, thank you for what you're doing over there, and thank you, Sock Valley, for what you're doing. You're absolutely right. Teacher shortages, but you know, we could throw money there. But I think what I want to—I don't want miss here—is we have a president now that values education, understands the role of education, and together we need to lift up the profession uh, where it needs to be. We need to honor our educators, not just during Teacher Appreciation Week, but we need to make sure that it's a viable profession. Let me tell you: 30 states, a mid-career teacher in a family of four will qualify for federal assistance. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable uh, in this profession. So we need to create better pathway programs for our students to become educators. You mentioned paraeducators. Our paraeducators show up every single day working hard for our students in those schoolhouses, in those communities. Let's make them teachers. How can we create innovative programming to give our paraeducators or climate specialists an opportunity to become certified teachers to then fill those shortage areas where we need uh, support for our students that can't read uh, in reading recovery or uh, ESL services. We, we have to be innovative. And I'm hoping now that there are financial resources that we have both leadership strategies to really fill those gaps. But the best way to do that is to really lift the profession and make sure that the students that we're serving now feel welcomed in our school so that they can consider themselves teachers in the future. So um, as far as teacher salary, uh, Mr. Secretary, and that was, that was actually my, my next question. Um, it, in fact, uh, let's see, let, let me, uh, so 20, in 2019 in the state of Illinois, we had more than 5,500 K through 12 teachers earning less than 40,000 a year. You know, to your point. Um, so, um, you know, I'm just wondering what we can do more at the federal level. I just uh, earlier this year, I introduced something again, this is in the handout that I gave you, Mr. Secretary, but we introduced something uh, out of my office called the Retaining Educators Takes Added Investment Now Act. You know, we, we love to, it's, it spells out retain um, it, and along with other provisions that it has in there, but it, it creates a fully refundable tax credit for teachers in Title I schools. Uh, the credits start at 5,800 and ramp up to 11,600 over the years to help retain staff. But so I'm, I'm wondering what else, and I, I hope that you'll be supportive. Please take a look at that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping those on, on this uh, subcommittee will be supportive. But is, is there anything else, any other investments that we should put into programs that fight teacher shortage and, and help the, the uh, pay increase, um, increasing Title I funding to help school districts increase teacher pay. Just curious as to any other ideas that you have specifically on how we can address that. Sure. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. I look forward to having more conversation with you about that Please. and lifting best practices because it does take everyone at the state level, takes at the federal level, but at the local level also. We need to think creatively with this opportunity that we have to hit the reset button. So some strategies as yours is a great idea. I talked about the pathway program to make sure that our paraeducators have an opportunity, but I think we need to do a better job starting in middle school, looking at pathways for teachers, for our students. But if our students have a good experience, they're more likely to want to do that. Competitive salaries are needed. Um, we need to really make sure that, um, you know, we're giving teachers a competitive salary and an opportunity to continue to grow. This is not just about the salary. It's about honoring the profession by giving professional learning opportunities, advancement opportunities, additional uh, higher education opportunities for our educators. It's really about making sure that we're taking care of the teachers once they choose that profession as well as recruiting them. I look forward I look to doing more with you on that as well. I, I, I do too, Mr. Secretary. Thanks. Thank you very much. My time is up and Madam, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Thank Mr. You. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Molinar. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good morning and thanks for uh, being here with us and for uh, sharing your uh, experience with us and uh, 
very much appreciate uh, your service and education, uh, both at the state and now at the federal level, as well as the local level and being hands-on educator. Um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit as we've gone through this global pandemic, obviously it's affected a lot of what we've been uh, seeing in the area of education. And, and it seems like there's been a lot of people innovating, trying to make things work um, and using creative ways, whether it's online learning, different uh, choice options. What, what have we learned through this process that may increase more innovation um, uh, opportunities for parents to tailor uh, programs that meet the needs of their, their individual students. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yes, thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Molina. You know, you, you brought up something that's really important. Let's not go back to what it was in March 2020, because that system that we had before wasn't serving all kids equitably. So you brought up uh, blended learning. I think, you know, while I think students need to be back in the classroom, the role of blended learning is, I think, should always be a part of how we educate students. Um, how we integrate social emotional well being of students needs to be something that we think about uh, more, it should be more intrinsic in the curriculum, in, in the experience of students versus wait for a student to have issues and then uh, react to it. Um, I've seen, you know, creative uh, ways for students, you know, my experience in Connecticut. So if we're if this is a classroom right now, it doesn't necessarily have to be taught uh, or the options um, that the district provides could be wider because there might be a teacher in a neighboring community where if two communities work together uh, to share uh, teacher expertise, we can offer more options for students. How beneficial is that for our rural students who maybe don't have the same choice of uh, classes because there are limited people in that community that can teach it? We need to be bold. We need to think outside of the box. And I encourage that for states to be creative with the funding to make sure that the programming that we give is better than what it was last year. Well, I appreciate that. And as, as someone who represents a rural district, I have seen the importance of uh, rural broadband and the need to expand that uh, to meet our educational needs for our students uh, and have introduced legislation called the Boost Act that uh, hopefully will help with that process. And it's very bipartisan legislation. Um, I also wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, you know, there are people um, sometimes who mistake, mistakenly refer to charter schools as private schools. Um, to me, they are part of our uh, educational public school framework, uh, often offer opportunities for innovation and targeted opportunities for families who may not have other opportunities. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, charter schools, the role that they play in educational choice in general? Sure. So, you know, I, I'll speak from experience in Connecticut. I Some of the greatest examples of innovation I saw from charter schools, uh, but I've also <laughs> seen amazing innovation from uh, tradi your traditional schools. It, really, they're, they're hubs of innovation, right? And I've seen them work, and I've seen other cases where it, it hasn't worked, and, and I've struggled with uh, the accountability in, in some places, but I've felt the same way about other traditional schools as well. So they provide an option for, for, uh, for students and oftentimes they're targeted toward a specific learning area or a specific need. So they're part of the, the portfolio of choices. But um, again, not that my, my thing is I, I don't ever want to support a system of winners and losers. And I want to make sure that all schools provide an opportunity for students to get a high quality education. Uh, I don't support one school at the expense of another uh, sure that's, sure that's position on that no i i appreciate that and i, I also just want to uh get your thoughts on uh the 1619 project I, I recognize that you're not advocating for that you're not uh, saying that we should have a federal curriculum um uh, but it does appear that in the guidance uh in the, the federal register it, it did mention the 1619 project which uh according to the you know, the editor in chief of the New York Times said the aim of the project is to reframe American history. And uh, I think there that, that raises a lot of concerns about revisionism, of uh, sort of breaking down the framework of how we've taught civics education. And, and as you pointed out, the importance of building unity. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, you, you know, you're aware of that and get your thoughts on that. 
Thank you, Representative. And, and you know, I appreciate, you know, you sharing your concern, and I'm open to having more conversation with you to hear your perspective. Uh, what I will say is, listen, yes, it touched a, a pain point for so many because it shows how divided we are as a nation in some places. I really feel that civics education is something that bipartisan, there's bipartisan support for that. We recognize that we need to do that. And I feel very strongly, very strongly that when done well, it should unite us under one flag, one country. Um, and we can do that while providing um, students with opportunities to look at materials and look at different perspectives. But again, you know, education in general should really unite us and lift us as a country. And I, I feel confident that our educators can do it. Uh, but I understand what you're saying, that it does bring up uh, divisions that maybe existed already. And we have to be conscious of that as we move forward in education. All right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I yield back. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and, and welcome, Secretary Cardona. Um, I'm glad to have a Secretary of Education that believes in the power of public education and is willing to support and protect our students in the public education system. I'm also encouraged that the president has continuously spoken to the issues of equity and eliminating disparities. And with regard to what our children have been educated um, in, I, I am very much aware of the fact that the experience of the African-American building of this country has been woefully inadequately dealt with in our public education system. And that is something that we need to do something about. And if we are seeking to look for an expansive uh, civics program that recognizes the contributions that other uh, communities, be they indigenous communities, Latin communities, black communities, their contribution to making this government great, the opportunity for students to learn at a very young age to respect and to recognize that these are communities of dignity and demand and, and, and are warranted respect, that's a good thing because our children become our adults. And our, our one, one thing we don't want is to have a whole bunch of uninformed adults that seize upon the capital of the United States again, um, wrongfully guided, wrong, wrongfully um, uh, coerced into doing things that were anti-democratic and were also um, uh, anti-unification of this country. Mr. Um, Mr. Secretary, do, do you believe that there is any such thing as separate but equal in education? And that's kind of a yes or a no. You know, we, we need to provide inclusive opportunities for students. So do you believe that you can acquire uh, equal and separate? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Because I understand that there's going to be a, a, a huge investment in our underserved, uh, underperforming um, schools. I'm particularly aware of the whole Abbott experience in the state of New Jersey, I'm sure you are too, where for decades we have been putting additional money into urban schools that have uh, been underperformed, that are uh, uh, intensely populated by uh, uh, impoverished uh, children from impoverished families, and how all of that investment has not yielded the kind of equality and outcomes that we are expecting. So I'd like to know what this administration's plan is to desegregate our schools, to ensure that there is equity of education um, and to ensure that students, irrespective of the zip code from which they come, will have access to good, diverse and, and high performing schools. Thank you for your passion. And, and let me just comment really quickly on what you said earlier about the experiences of not only African-American, Latinos, but also AAPI and women in our country's history is critically important for all students to hear. And not just for those students who are of those of uh, that background, for all students to see the and, country. And, 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 not, and not to be celebrated one month a year, every year, throughout their learning experience, absolutely. 
Correct. Thank you for that. But, you know, we have uh, in this budget plan also uh, a request for $100 million to help diversify our schools, provide programming where students learn in a diverse setting. I benefit as a father uh, of have, from having my children learn in a diverse environment. I can't tell you there's not a price I could put on that. Uh, for me, it's really important that my students, my children, my own personal children learn in an environment where they see people that look like them, but also people that are very different from them. That's what we want to do to prepare our students for a world that's like that. And I think there is an investment in that in this budget plan. And there's a strong belief in this administration, in this department, that there's value for our students in that. I know that, Secretary, and I need to see how we intend to accomplish that. Because all the good intentions in the world you know, need to be followed by a plan of action and a degree of accountability. And that hasn't been the situation. So I, I really look forward to that. One quick question. States have to have their plans in to reopen schools by June the 7th. How soon thereafter do you think those schools will have the resources to actually implement the plans? We want to get the funding out as soon as possible. Uh, so, you know, if we get them in June, we're going to move to move it along. Uh, there's no, there should be no delay. What we want to ensure in that June 7th plan is that there's aim for equity, as was mentioned today on this call, and also ensuring that stakeholders are part of that process. Parents should be in the in the conversation at the beginning. Thank you, Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair. I realize my time is up. If there is a second round, I certainly do want to talk to uh, the Secretary about um, some other issues, particularly impacting African American students, Black students in particular. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we will have a second round. It will be three minutes, uh, but so that we uh, and uh, Congressman Klein. Uh, thank you, Chairman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, for holding this hearing. Secretary Cardona, thank you for being here. I agree with your comments that education can serve as a great equalizer. We have to ensure that we encourage uh, uh, equality of opportunity, not equity of outcome, however. Uh, my home state of Virginia has a long history of being a leader on fighting for equality on the educational front. Barbara Rose Johns of Virginia led a walkout at the Robert Russell Moton High School at age 16 which initiated a case called Davis v. Prince Edward. This later became one of the five cases that the U.S. Supreme Court reviewed in Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka when it declared segregation unconstitutional. I'm grateful for her contributions and look forward to working with you to ensure that all students have that equality of opportunity for a high quality education. Additionally, I appreciate your recognition of the unprecedented increase in spending that President Biden has proposed uh, apparently math was not his strong suit uh, when it came uh, to his education because this budget that he has put forward is so far out of whack. Um, after so much extraordinary emergency spending, uh, it's, it's quite ridiculous. The president's skinny budget proposes nearly $103 billion for Department of Education programs, which is an increase of almost $30 billion. That totals 41% above fiscal year 2021 enacted level. Uh, this level of an increase in spending in the same year that Congress has allocated uh, extensive funds to mitigate the effects of COVID is highly irresponsible. Uh, when I served in the Virginia General Assembly, we were re required to balance our budget. As lawmakers, we must make difficult decisions and determine how to most appropriately spend taxpayers' money with sound authority and reason. Uh, with that, I'll ask you, Mr. Secretary, much of the nation's conversation in recent years has been centered around student debt, which surpassed over $1.57 trillion in 2020. Uh, this is a problem, but canceling it is not the solution. Uh, that would devalue others' choices who determine that going to community college for all or part of their education, or that completing an apprenticeship, which would allow them to start in the workforce debt-free, was the right decision for them. Others have determined that their best path was through a four-year degree while incurring some debt. With many options that are flexible to students' needs, the federal government should not be picking and choosing certain life choices to pay for out of the paychecks of others. Uh, what will you do as secretary to encourage students to look at all options available to them as a path toward a successful career? Thank you, Representative. And, and you know, I want to be very clear. We could talk about individual strategies. I want to make sure that it, what we're what we're a part of right now, and what we're asking is for a transformational shift in how we're looking at education to make sure that it serves as the foundation of our country's growth. 
as the president stated in his address, you know, other countries are not waiting. Um, so there have been years of disinvestment in education. And, and what we're trying to do now is correct that. Um, so for those students who have been underserved for years, generationally, we're seeing the symptoms of that. And I, I think intervention costs more than prevention. I look at a good education system is the best way to lift our country. With regard to the student debt, uh, you know, we have to do more in the agency to make sure we're providing uh, pathways to affordability for our students. Uh, and I think public service loan forgiveness, ensuring that there's a good return on investment for our students that go to uh, college, ensuring that um, we're giving them every opportunity to be successful in college and not have a, a mountain of debt is to me just as important as revisiting the loan forgiveness process. So by hiring Richard Cordray, by uh, bringing talent on board that understand that, that we have to advocate for students and all that we do, I feel confident that we're gonna get there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your department announced last month it was extending COVID-19 relief to defaulted borrowers who have legacy loans under the Federal Family Education Loan Program. While that decision was expected, you also announced a new requirement that was not, that guarantee agencies move newly defaulted loans to the department. If the goal is to help these borrowers, this new requirement will not accomplish that. Uh, these state and nonprofit agencies have relationships with these borrowers and can move quickly to remove the default and restore their credit record. In contrast, if the department takes these loans, it will be well into 2022 before borrowers see any relief remotely close to what guarantee agencies can do for them and in an accelerated time frame. As well, transitioning these loans to new for-profit servicers will only add to borrower confusion already intensified because of new policies and procedures as a result of the pandemic. Given all of this, my question to you is, would you be willing to revisit this mandatory assignment proposal and allow nonprofit and state guarantee agencies to continue doing what they do best and frankly were created to do. Uh, if not, I worry these borrowers will not be a priority for the department and critical relief further delayed. Thank you, Representative. And I'll be quick because I know the time is up. In fact, the reason why we brought them in is because we want to make sure that we're advocating for them and that we're keeping them at the center of the conversations and making decisions that are in their best interest. Thank you, though. All right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Madam Chair, you'll back. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Lawrence. Thank you. Um, I reintroduced the Pell to Grad Act legislation that would extend students' lifetime Pell Grant eligibility to 16 semesters, and it will allow them to receive the Pell Grant Award during their undergraduate education to utilize their remaining eligibility for a graduate degree. Several of my colleagues have referenced the burden of student loan debt. I believe this legislation is a meaningful first step toward promoting access to post-secondary education. So I want to commend the Biden administration for proposing the largest one-time increase in this program since 2009. I want to congratulate you and welcome you to this seat of uh, someone that I feel very confident can rise to the occasion. So my question to you, can you explain the benefits that expanding lifetime Pell Grant eligibility could have for students, especially those able to use their remaining eligibility for a graduate degree? Thank you very much. And, and I agree for some students, uh, 16 semesters is not enough and we need to support them. You know, for many of these students, it's first gen students who are navigating that space uh, for the first time and, um, you know, are, are charting a new course and, and addressing what their needs are. And, and sometimes it takes longer. So I, I support that and I thank you for recognizing that, you know, the system needs to evolve to the needs of the students and not the other yes. way around. So, you know, Pell Grants, as you mentioned, this is a, an historic allotment toward that. In 1979, I think it was 75% of tuition was covered uh, for in-state colleges by Pell. That's significant. Now it's like about 25%. So it didn't keep up with inflation, clearly. And for many students, when they see that, they make the decision not to go to college. So we have to do something about that. We have to give access equity uh, to higher education. We know there's greater earning potential. So this goes a long way to doing that. Uh, so it's something that I know that for many students, it's gonna be the reason why they go to college. 
Yes. Uh, for other students, it's the reason why they're buying a house or contributing uh, to the economy by uh, being able to do some of those things that they couldn't do if they were burdened with debt. There's so many, it really breaking the cycle of poverty is what it is. So before I close, I want to touch on our efforts to return our students back to school. Um, and I believe your decision to provide a free social and ec emotional learning course uh, while you were serving as the Commissioner of Education was in incredibly timely, considering what we're going through with remote and hybrid learning. One of my biggest concerns is how we can ensure that students have the resources that they need to readjust following this year of pandemic, including access to mental health services. Unfortunately, we've seen the number of suicides go up um, and just all of the social issues abuse and other things that our children have been going through. How will you use your education as a commissioner during this pandemic to help shape the department's guidance to use by schools across the country, particularly in the area of mental health? Thank you for that. We know uh, our students have been hit hard and you know we have to be prepared when we reopen the doors and turn on the lights to make sure that we're meeting the students of today they're different than the students of March 2020. Our students have experienced family loss. They experienced joblessness of their family. They haven't seen their loved ones in, year, in over a year in, in some cases. We have to be prepared to meet their needs. So instead of just additional 15, 20 minutes with the school counselor for some students, we need to infuse social emotional well-being into the curriculum, into the experience of every children, every child. We need to make mental health support more accessible and remove the stigma that goes around that. We need to provide better uh, professional learning opportunities for all educators to know what to look for, the signs. Because Secretary, this is the area I wanna jump into. We know that we do not have enough mental health professionals to meet that goal. And I'm so glad you have that vision. And I would love to talk to you at another time about how do we build a workforce gotcha. of mental health um, professionals to address the children in our schools. And I don't want to leave without talking about student debt. Black women carry the largest amount of student debt in America. So when we talk about the Pell Grant, we talk about other student loan um, challenges, we have to recognize that Black women are carrying the brunt of that. Thank you so much. My time is up. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Congressman Harder. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Deloro, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Cardona, for being here. Uh, I've spoken previously about the importance of career and technical education and how those programs really play a, a vital role in helping folks develop the skills that they need that are in high demand in our, our current labor market. In a district like mine, uh, only about 17% of adults have a four-year college degree, 83% don't. And so if all we're doing is telling folks that the only route to the middle class is through a four-year college degree, we're gonna be leaving out the vast majority uh, of a lot of folks across the country. And even as we're doing more to accelerate uh, people going to college, we, we can't forget about uh, everybody, everybody else. It's something that we've been working on a lot. I, I know there's a lot of challenges with expanding the availability of access to CTE and skills programs. I've introduced a bill called the uh, Trades and Career Education Skills Package. Uh, last Congress, I'll be doing so again. Uh, that package is very focused on trying to create more opportunities for hands-on career education, starting in elementary school, going on through high school and community college. Uh, really focusing on partnerships with local industries to make sure that those students are learning uh, locally relevant skills, uh, as well as expanding access uh, for federal scholarships for short-term uh, high-quality certificate programs. Um, frankly, I, I would have liked to see career and technical education discussed more explicitly in the president's discretionary budget proposal, and, and that's something I hope to see when the full budget is released. M my question, Mr. Secretary, is, is given the critical role that CTE plays in communities like mine. How do you envision the Department of Education will support scaling these programs up? Thank you, um, Representative Harder. And I can't agree with you more. I, you know, I was a graduate of a technical high school. Where I learned automotive and I chose to go into teaching, but I see the value of giving students options and connecting those options to workforce needs. 
in the community. And I'm sure in California, there's so many uh, opportunities to do that. So here are some very tangible things that I think should happen. We should take our schools, especially those schools with labs and, and, and create a second shift, right? Beautiful buildings, let's create a second shift. No reason why the lights are off at three o'clock and give uh, underemployed uh, families parents an opportunity to go and get a credential. We need to connect that with the learning that the students are getting. We need to think about how our community colleges are setting up shop in our high schools after hours. So from three to 8 p.m., we have credentialing programs. So underemployed adults have a second chance to go back and get their credential, get their degree and, and, and go back into the community. So we need to think outside of the box. You know, with this funding and these resources, uh, we have the opportunity to really think big on this. And I agree with you. We need to make sure that we're not just saying four years of college or bust. There are so many other opportunities. I look forward to learning more from you, working with you to expand opportunities because at this agency, that's one of my goals to make sure we're doing a better job creating pathways, not only for our students, but for our adults who want another opportunity at learning. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, it's wild to me that we offer Pell Grants and, and other scholarships for some programs. But if you want to be a, a maintenance mechanic, which is a job where there's a desperate shortage of in, in my community, uh, it pays six figures. It's a really fantastic career. Uh, but you are not eligible for the same federal scholarships if you want to go on that career path. Would you consider utilizing Pell Grants and or any other funding streams to better support individuals to pursue certificates and, and, and other certifications in that space or, or other spaces like that? Yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. As I said before, we have to evolve our systems to make sure that our policies are supporting students. Obviously, accountability has to be a part of it. We want to make sure our students are getting a good return on investment. But yes, we have to make sure we're, we're nimble to meet the demands that are out there and the needs of our learners. So yes, I definitely would be in support of reviewing that a little bit more and, and getting a uh, more perspective on that, making sure we're serving our students the best we can. Definitely. That's, that's, that's great to hear. Uh, I know one, one last question, really exposure to these skills programs has been shown to promote career readiness. Uh, what about, you know, you, you mentioned some ideas or programs at the, at the high school level or, or earlier. Um, you know, what can we be doing to support students as early as possible? Obviously not every student, and you're a perfect example of that, is gonna take us up on that opportunity, but at least it gives folks uh, an option if they decide to, to do it. How else can we be sort of supporting uh, workforce development efforts uh, as, as early as possible? Sure. Thank you for that. So a couple of thoughts on that. Not only does it improve career readiness, but student engagement. Students learn better when they're doing things, when they're hands on. And we learned this year that schooling doesn't have to be in a schoolhouse. Maybe students early, early on go on trips and see what's happening in their community, what, you know, advanced manufacturing looks like in their community or what STEM fields look like in their community. So we have to get students out a lot earlier and we have to bring our partners in. Why not? focus on getting some of our workforce partners on our boards of education to help shape the policy at the local level to make this something that's not just a, a, a fancy program for some students, but infused as part of the program for all students. It's great to hear. Look forward to working with you on that. And thank you so much for, for appearing before the subcommittee. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I yield back the remainder of my time. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Um, uh, everyone's been through a five minute round. What I'd like to do is uh, to do a, a, a next round with three minutes and have uh, people adhere uh, to, uh, to, to three minutes so we can get everyone's questions in. Uh, with that, um, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, let, let me begin. This is about uh, ACICS, um, the uh, for-profit accreditor. Um, which was uh, they were reinstated in 2018 by the by Secretary DeVos and the Trump administration. Now this is the accreditor that was responsible for Education Corporation of America, Corinthian Colleges, um, uh, ITT, uh, the for-profit chains who precipitously closed their doors. Uh, there was a Ronald National Uni Reagan National University was accredited as an institution. They had no students or faculty, so. Um, accreditors are supposed to oversee quality, serve as gatekeepers, um, and uh, they, they need to be removed when they fail in that responsibility. Now, the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity has recommended that federal recognition of ACICS be removed. Will the Department of Education reach a decision on whether to remove recognition? How will you ensure proper oversight for profit colleges? Uh, thank you, Chair DeLauro. 
yes, we stand by the decision, uh, and we recognize that it's our responsibility to protect students by making sure that uh, we remove folks that are uh, that are not helping produce a good return on investment for our students. They're going to get their due process, and they should. Uh, but we stand by the decision to to move in the direction that we did. Okay. Um, let me, uh, English learners, particularly challenging year, uh, how will the department's Office of English Language Acquisition work with states and district to make sure these students are getting the support that they need? Thank you. We need to do better than ever before. We need to see a new day for our office for multilingual learners. Um, going back to where we were is, is not good enough. Early childhood education is one, but language support services for students there's such a gap between the practice and the research on that. We need to go back to what we know learn works best, honoring and valuing the native language while lifting the second language so we can have multilingual learners. There's a lot of work that has to be done. I look forward to engaging with that with my sleeves rolled up because this is important work for our country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With, with the few minutes I have left, uh, just let me just say in your conversation with Congressman Harder about uh, uh, utilizing schools in a different way. It would seem to me that we could use community schools uh, in, in a way that these were open usually from early morning until eight or nine o'clock at night, that that would be a good vehicle for dealing with how we deal with uh, new learning opportunities uh, 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 and workforce development efforts. Absolutely. I think you're, you're spot on, especially because, uh, you know, families trust their child's teacher. They trust their child's principal. They know that school community. They feel comfortable there. We really need to rethink how we use our space. Okay. Thank you. I once taught at the, as, a, as a substitute teacher at the Dr. Conti Community School in New Haven, Connecticut. So uh, with that, let me yield and yield to my colleague, Congressman uh, Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would have enjoyed that class, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, if I can, Mr. Secretary, two quick questions. Uh, one, I'm very heartened to hear about your determination and, uh, in reopening schools full time. Uh, look, in my district, most of them have been functioning since August. Uh, every In every case where full time was better than virtual. And frankly, in one case, I was talking to the superintendent yesterday, he had yeah, offered both options. About two thirds of the students came in on a regular basis. Uh, about a third did not. He said it's a dramatic difference between those that didn't. We're, he said we're actually removing next year the option of, of going virtual. Uh, have you thought about tying any of the distribution of money uh, that's going to be under your authority to the restoration of five-day uh, education? It's my expectation that by the fall, all students have in-person learning options five days a week. I, I, I really, you know, I want it now in the spring. Um, but we'll problem solve with folks, uh, but we need to provide in-person learning opportunities for all students five days a week in the uh, fall. That's, the, that's my expectation. I, I, really, I hold funds if, if, if they don't do it. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate that, and I, I hope you, again, use whatever tools you have, because I think the evidence, both medically for the health of the kids and educationally is pretty clear. Second question I have also relates to distribution. I'm being very candid with you. I think one of the problems that um, uh, my side of the aisle had on the American Recovery Plan was the lack of, of uh, information in the original legislation about how money would be distributed. Let me give you an example. It doesn't relate to education. But uh, we had a formula in the American Cares Act that distributed money on a per capita basis. It was changed. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, the American Recovery Act. And frankly, it was changed in ways that the money was skewed heavily toward blue states at the expense of red states. There were actually 20-odd governors that protested this. Um, so I'm very interested, as you develop standards, what your criteria is going to be. It's an enormous amount of money, $130 billion at, at your disposal, your department's disposal. What are the kind of standards you'll use? What kind of transparency will we have in seeing those standards? before you actually begin to distribute those funds. Thank you for that question. You know, we have an opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity, not only to support students, but to provide equitable opportunities for students and really address some of those issues that happened before. But we also have to be conscious of, we're working, we're using taxpayer money. So we have to be as transparent as possible. We have to be clear about our intentions and be very purposeful when communicating what the money should be used for. Uh, we want to, make sure we're addressing the pandemic uh, impact. Some students were impacted more than others. 
That should be driving how decisions are being made, nothing else. As much as you could share that with us as you're developing them or get there, I think it would be very helpful to every member of the committee to have that information. So I thank you very much. Again, my time is up. I'm, I'm going to live by my chairman's admonition. So uh, th thank you very much, and thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. Congressman Clark. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the second round. Um, Secretary Cardona, I'd like to go back to some of the discussion that we have been having around a rule that followed uh, President Biden's executive order, which directed the federal government to pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, especially people of color. And I wanted to give you a chance to address some of what my colleagues have raised both here today and, and otherwise about that helping students connect with the history of our country, uh, with the uh, history of racism and the toxic roots of slavery, can you tell us what is at the basis of this and how you hope that this education around the history of our country will be uniting and not dividing? Right. So, you know, I think that when we talk about disengaged youth, when we talk about exclusionary practices, um, disengaged families from schools, we really need to look at those as symptoms of uh, something greater. And, and I'm speaking now from my years of experience in education as an educator uh, at different levels. We need to do better to engage our students and our families in learning that is culturally responsive, that um, sees our students, sees their experience, validates their contributions to our country. I think if you do that, all students benefit, not just the students whose history has been omitted uh, or, or um, left out. So again, I, I've seen it done. I've, I've been uh, a recipient of an educational system where when others are valued, I see how this it builds our country. I mean, that's the beauty of our country, right? The diversity and the different stories. This is a very unique country and we shouldn't lose the opportunity to really unite our students um, uh, and, and have pride for their country by doing this. And I don't think it's mutually exclusive. You can share the rich history of others and the contributions of others while also uh, sharing the pride and teaching the pride of our country and, and how we're united uh, under one flag. So I, I, I reject the belief that by doing this, uh, we're dividing. Uh, in fact, I think those who think that don't really understand what happens in our classrooms and the roles of our educators to bring students from different cultures together, uh, learning together. There's so much benefit to that. I think that that experience is greater in many ways than the experience that they get from whatever content they have in front of them. So we recognize the opportunity we have as educators to bring our country together and listen to our students and give them an opportunity to share their voice. They're ready for it. Sometimes the adults take a little bit longer, but they're ready for it. Thank you so much. Congressman Harris. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, just to follow up on that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you. You want people to know the rich history and contributions, but, you know, in Baltimore, when they tear down a statue of Christopher Columbus, that doesn't contribute to sharing rich, rich history and contributions. Now, the Department of Education made the front page of the Wall Street Journal last Friday with a story uh, that, I'm, that I hope you're familiar with about uh, the Courtney Report on student loans of great concern. This is, this is, you know, we are the Appropriations Committee, and, and the, the focus of this article was that the Biden administration has outright rejected the Courtney Report and will continue to, uh, to falsify or to claim large profits on student loans or even small profits on student loans uh, portfolio, when in fact uh, the Courtney Report indicated that probably a third of the student loans will never be repaid. And this does bear on the ability, for instance, to refinance student loans, because if on paper refinance results in less profit that was never there to begin with, you might be less likely to refinance loans. So first off, the, the article says, uh, claims, and I don't never believe anything I read in, in the, in the uh, media uh, on, on first blush, 
It says that Biden officials never saw Mr. Courtney's report. Mr. Secretary, did you see Mr. Courtney's report? Uh, my staff is aware of the report, and um, I, I stand by the decision did, to make sure you, that. Did you see Mr. Mr. Courtney's report? And did any of your staff see Mr. Read Mr. Courtney's report? See it because the Wall Street Journal claims your staff didn't see it. They dismissed it out of hand as some. Betsy DeVos, uh, you know, you know, scheme against uh, student loans. And now, Mr. Courtney is, was, in fact, a very high-ranking individual in a very foremost financial services firm who ran their student loan portfolio. This is not, this is not someone with a political agenda. This is someone who made great success in the private finance sector. You stand by their decision having never seen the report. Is that your testimony today in front of this committee? You know who else has a lot of credibility in the field? But Mr. 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 Secretary, excuse me. If you don't want to answer the question, just say, look, I don't want to answer the question. Have you, are you standing by the, the Biden administration, Department of Education officials in their assessment, having never seen the report yourself? I stand by the decision of my team to not validate a report that was uh, developed without the same checks and balances that the reports that we use. Uh, so, so, you, so you think that it's okay to dismiss it without actually reading it and seeing what it says? Because this involves hundreds of billions of dollars of potential student loan default that is on our budget contributing to our deficit. Mr. Secretary, I'm disappointed that you would dismiss an, a report this serious. And I, look, I understand you're smiling about this. Nothing to smile about. This is hundreds of billions of dollars in student loans with the administration dismissing out of hand without the secretary at even having seen the report, I yield back. I have confidence in my team and I stand by the decisions we've made. Thank you. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for standing by what you believe is the right thing for our students. And we had enough of Betsy DeVos and her misguided um, policies for four years. Um, let me just say that when I did a pledge allegiance to the flag and I say um, one nation under God, I feel something when I say that because I believe it. And so I'm very much uh, appreciative of the fact that you've mentioned that a number of times. I know that most recently there was a collaborative and a new collaborative that was um, created and that there was a national convening for two days uh, around educational issues, um, particularly relating to the pandemic learning loss. It was just familiar. The, the, the opening summit, is that what you're referring to? Uh, well, I have it down here as a national convening of the collaborative, a two day uh, discussion of leaders and stakeholders to design evidence-based programs to, a, to address the pandemic loss. The Summer Learning Collaborative, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing some of the outcomes, particularly as they relate to the impact of the pandemic learning loss on minority students um, and what we're proposing with regard to giving that the attention it needs. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing that up. You know, the Summer Learning Collaborative was really intended to make sure we take innovative ideas, best practices from across the country, share them with the focus on recovering from the pandemic in non-traditional ways. I, I often said, I, I'd love to have summer learning programs without one ditto, right? We need students to have hands-on experiences. So that's what that was. We're gonna be releasing a report soon, probably next month, about the impact of the pandemic on different students um, to make sure that when we reopen schools, we're addressing those um, with, with energy and making sure that the resources that we have are aimed at that. Definitely we'll keep you in the loop and look forward to having more conversations with you about And particularly that. mental health services for uh, black youth uh, in, in particular. Thank you very much. Let me just say that New Jersey has a reputation for having one of the best school systems in the country, but we also have the most segregated school system, one of the most segregated school systems, and you'll find the differential is very stark and what happens in those schools. And I very much am a, a magnet school person. I've got lots of ideas. I've got lots of ideas. What I think that um, the, uh, the other schools should have been laboratories. 
uh, and that we should have learned some and be able to apply, not substitute for public, just plain old public schools. And I look forward to having discussions with you because this is a very important subject to me. And I thank you for being here. And Madam Chair, I, I yield back and thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that there are, um, uh, Ms. Lawrence, Congresswoman Lawrence, Congressman Harder. Okay, uh, what I'd not like to do is to yield to the ranking member for any uh, you know, closing comments that, oh, wait a minute, Congresswoman Lawrence, uh, this is a three minute round, you, uh, you're recognized. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time. I just want to just echo and show some bipartisanship here. I think in our commitment to developing a skilled workforce that we need to look at Pell Grants and other resources for those who choose not to go to a four-year university, that we're giving them the resources to aid them in attending these certified community colleges programs. And again, the point I wanted to make about the skilled workforce that we need for the mental health, uh, when I dealt with Flint and we were trying to mitigate the, the lead poisoning in those children, the one thing they said they needed were social workers and mental health providers in the schools because we knew that the lead poisoning would have an adverse impact on their development and they would act out in school. And we didn't need to put them in detention and expel them. We needed mental health trained professionals so that they could care for these children. The number one thing we heard was that there are not enough people going into social work or the mental health profession. And so in your role, how do we feed support and incentivize, you know, we have Teach America, we have programs for rural doctors. How do we grab hold to this? Because we're also dealing with this in policing. We need mental health professionals to address these psychotic situations instead of calling 911 to arrest somebody, beat them, and unfortunately sometimes kill them. So we have a crisis when it comes to mental health workforce. And um, that, that was my second question. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Um, and you know, you're absolutely right. We need to be proactive. Uh, what we saw in Flint should serve as a, as a lesson. We're coming out of a pandemic and the mental uh, health needs of our students and our staff, I would add, um, need to be at the forefront, our social emotional well-being. So not only do we have to plan for it, but we have to make sure we have qualified staff. I think the community school model really helps that. How are we engaging with our community partners? You know, uh, I, I remember having experiences as a assistant superintendent with the community health center where we had a good partnership there and we had our nonprofits or uh, other agencies in the community. You know, it takes a village, right? So how do we think outside of the box? That's why this investment um, in community schools is critically important to get to those underlying issues. It's hard to learn. Your, your academic bandwidth is diminished if you're hungry, if you have if you have housing instability. So we need to make sure we're thinking about the whole child and providing support and services. And you're absolutely right. We need to do more for mental health. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Thank you. Um, let me uh, now yield to uh, the ranking member, Congressman Cole, for any further comments or uh, closing remarks that you would like to make. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for holding the hearing. It's always a great hearing. Mr. Secretary, it's really good to have you here and have an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And I, I appreciate your testimony and I appreciate very much the spirit in which you approach the hearing. Uh, let me go back and, and make a few points. We do, and I would be remiss not to point this out, have a fundamental disagreement overall with the president's budget in the sense that we think there's too little in defense, too much in domestic spending. Your department is probably at the top of that list. A 41% increase is pretty generous, to say the least. And we think there's going to have to be some adjustment there. And if we can't get there, you know, what I would fear is an appropriator is we'll stumble into what's called a continuing resolution. You'll be living with last year's budget. That's something that none of us on either side of the aisle want to do. 
but I also want to point out there's some areas of agreement, and I want to applaud some of your efforts. I'm particularly pleased with uh, some of your proposals like IDEA. There's no question we need to be doing more there. And uh, frankly, I think that gives local schools a lot of flexibility as to how they help students with special needs. Uh, I, I like the emphasis uh, uh, as well on the Pell Grant that, that I know uh, our, our chairwoman is also a big fan of. That, again, provides a lot of opportunity uh, for other students. We, uh, When I was chairman and always with the uh, our current chairman support, uh, we were very big on TRIO and Gear Up. We thought those are very important programs uh, for uh, first-generation college students to, to give them the chance to succeed. So there's a lot of, uh, of common ground here, uh, and, uh, and we look forward to working with you in those areas. Uh, I would also tell you, and I'm going to go back and as I hit the opening question, I'm very concerned about the civics issue. I'm very concerned about when I, when, when I see a, a departmental, you know, federal registry notice that cites the 619 project, controversial scholars, that these are going to be the criteria that we use. That's going to be a problem. Uh, and uh, that is not, to me, allowing local people to set uh, the, uh, the curriculum. Uh, it's quite frankly federal interference, and it's pushing a particular point of view. I'm not going to drag you into history, but I'd feel a lot better if I saw Joseph Ellis and Ron Cherno and those kind of people cited. Although I would tell you, you're citing a grant. You probably should never lent, uh, mention a specific type of individual because every historian will have a point of view. That's not what we're trying to do here uh, in this. So, again, I welcome a continued dialogue with you about, the, about that important issue. I appreciate, too, uh, you seem to agree with a number of our our colleagues that we need in in person learning. I mean, I again, I think the medical evidence is absolutely clear on this. Was clear a long time ago. I think uh, the hearings we've had would show some of the social consequences of not having kids in school. Uh, everything from drug addiction to uh, you know isolation to mental health problems suggest how important that is. And I know from talking to my own son, who's a classroom teacher. Uh, how concerned he was that kids weren't in classrooms where you had a lot of teachers there that cared about kids that were in a position to check on them, provide structure in their life. Some of these kids, that's the place where they get structure and get protection. So getting them, uh, you know, unhooked as much as possible from uh, virtual learning and back where they're in a more traditional classroom setting is a, is a goal I think we all share and, um, I uh, hope we can work together. I don't mean we lose the tools. We all know technology can be a marvelous tool and, and it's something we need. But uh, I think, again, the evidence is clear. School-age children need to be in school uh, and we need to be using the levers we have to encourage people to do that as much as possible. And, and from your testimony, I, I take that uh, you have that same kind of view. Uh, let me just, uh, again, end with this. I want to thank the chairwoman again for the hearing. I know how passionate uh, she is on these issues, and I think rightfully so. Uh, you know, I think uh, we live in a society where education is the key to upward mobility. We want to give every child that opportunity, regardless of the circumstances uh, in which they uh, come into the world. Or, um, you know, we, we know uh, uh, they don't all come in an equal footing, and uh, some folks need more help than others, and some communities have been left behind. So you'll find no disagreement there. Uh, we just simply want to work with you on the tools that we uh, think are effective. I will go back to my favorites, uh, Trio and Gear Up, just to say sometimes old tools, you know, are good tools. I, I've watched multiple administrations. They always need to want to do something new. Uh, and that's good. You know, we need to be pressing on, uh, uh, but we need to remember sometimes that when we've got something that works and it's worked for 50 years and I'll point to Trio, it's produced 5 million college graduates for this country. I wonder how many of those kids that, that went through Trio would have graduated from college absent that program or would have even been there in the first place. Uh, and I'd say that's a good program. That's a program that's produced for the American people and it's given millions of our fellow Americans opportunities that their parents and grandparents never ever had. So uh, Again, we look forward to working with you to find common ground. Always look forward to working with my friend, uh, the chairman. And thank you again. And uh, believe me, I'm counting the days and, and where we can sit down in person and have these kind of discussions uh, at length. Because I value your personal experience. I think it's a model of the American dream in action. I appreciate your commitment. 
to uh, educating children, every child, providing opportunity. You, uh, you don't only say those things, your experience over a lifetime, and my good friend, the chairman's uh, uh, high praise for you, tells me that that's true, that you, you know, the values that you profess are the values you live by and the values you've made your career by. So, again, look forward to having the opportunity to work with you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for holding the hearing. I yield back. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, I thank the ranking member uh, for his comments and uh, would uh, just reiterate, and I'm thankful for the partnership that we do have on the Civic Secure Democracy Act, and uh, it specifically prohibits uh, any use of the funds for uh, a national curriculum in American history or even in civics education. So I'm hopeful that we can continue to pursue that. I think civics education is something that is really critical uh, for the people in this country. I think it, it helps to uh, really uh, strengthen our democracy in so many ways um, uh, that we need to think about uh, for, for the uh, for, for the for the future. Um, and I would just uh, uh, j just a, a brief uh, personal anecdote. As my father arrived in the United States at age 13 as an immigrant from Italy, uh, and they put him in the seventh grade uh, in the city of New Haven. Um, and uh, he was asked to, to find the word a janitor in one of the classes, and he didn't speak or, or, or the, the language or, or neither read or write the language, and uh, he didn't know what the word janitor meant. And uh, But he drew on his Italian um, uh, heritage, and he, he focused on the word genitori, and the genitori means parents. Um, and that's the way he described the word janitor. And at that moment, his teachers and his uh, classmates laughed at him. Uh, my father left school in the seventh grade, uh, which was the end of a formal education, uh, because of uh, that kind of humiliation. Uh, he went on to serve his country in the military, served on the city council in the city of New Haven, and moved on uh, with a wonderful career in our in our community in our city but those days of when uh, we do not recognize uh, the strengths of those who come from uh, different places different lands different experiences uh, and that we and our need to embrace them uh, is critical uh, in terms of our children and move and moving forward um, in, in education and I want to say a thank you to you uh, Secretary Cardona, for your commitment to our children, um, uh, and our students, all ages, races, sexes, backgrounds, um, and uh, utilizing, as the ranking member said, uh, what education uh, is. And, uh, you know, my parents spent a lifetime making sure I had the best of uh, the academic experiences, which would, uh, who could foretell that I would wind up where I am uh, today. Um, but uh, it is the great equalizer. Uh, education. Education uh, for families today is the way that they believe that their children uh, will be able to succeed uh, for the future. And recognizing that it's uh, our children's God-given talent uh, that uh, 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 promotes them. And whatever the old tools that, or the new tools uh, that we want to utilize uh, to be able to have them realize their dreams and aspirations, uh, which is what our education uh, should be uh, about. And I want to say a thank you um, uh, to you, Mr. Secretary. The budget does place um, uh, strong funding increases for Title I special education, Pell Grants, higher education, community schools, let's bring them back, and so many other areas. Um, universal preschool for three and four-year-olds, free community college, teacher development to be able to be more prepared to teach our, our our youngsters and as we reflect on what we do as appropriators we look to a budget um that in fact invests in students and teachers public schools higher education career technical education and we want to make sure yes that the funds are utilized um in the manner that uh has been uh set set forth so um, above all, it's about making sure that average citizens today have a better chance and a better life, um, and that American dream becomes a reality. Uh, I'll just close with this. It also says that uh, poverty is unacceptable, and poverty is, in some of our districts, 
and some of our communities as the biggest roadblock uh, to youngsters being able to get a good education uh, with good schools, with good teachers, uh, with good curricula and a direction for them for the future. And we do have the capacity uh, to uh, uh, help to abolish uh, poverty so the kids can get an equal opportunity for the future. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much uh, for your testimony today. And uh, with that, I'll bang my hand on the table here, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, and thank my colleagues very, very much uh, for their interest uh, and their questions this morning. Thank you.